Welcome to Compression, the quest to $100 million in just one year. Join me, your host, Logan Freeman, in this one-of-a-kind interactive podcast experience where I am on a quest to compress three years of achievement and production into 12 months. And no, the answer is not to just work harder. I'm bringing you not only ideas and concepts that are complete at the theoretical level, but they're also effective at the applied level. Look guys, knowledge is not power. It is potential power. Knowledge plus massive strategic action equals power. We're talking about strategy, systems, accountability, all in real time. This is Compression. And we are back. I feel like this is the second time in a row I, I get to say we are back for another episode of the Compression Pod, guys. Yes. Hey, Brother Logan, how are you, man? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. Coming off a, a really fun week. Um, you know, fun in the sense that it's challenging. And, uh, you know, we're we're bringing on two uh, additional hires into our company. And I'm looking at this thing like, you know, that's that's true you know, eight employees, which is just unbelievable. Um, but the challenge being that, you know, as a small business owner, your payroll continues to rise and we're in a shifting market, which it's more difficult to find projects to do. And so those are new challenges. So I got some some new books, some new things, some new ideas that I'm working on. And um, I was with our buddy Brock Thomas yesterday. And it's always a good guy to to spend some time with. And and we were talking about you and and uh, you know, Brock and I got out on the I meant to send you the picture. Brock and I got out on the, the golf course. And I mean, that guy doesn't matter what market there is going on. That guy figures figures it out. And uh, he knows how to make money and he's super humble. And um, but he's he's a little mastermind in and of himself. And uh and so just spending time around him, pulling ideas out, um, been doing that with a few other folks because I'm taking September here to kind of um, really figure out where the the business needs to go, where I can drum up some new opportunities. I'm getting ready to cycle back in for a 90 day uh, compression sprint. And so I'm just kind of gearing up for that right now, man, charging up and, and getting ready for it. That's amazing, man. Yeah. Um, you know, you got to stay around good people, right? That yeah. that fire keeps you warm and inspires you. You know, that's I right. Spend a, a time with Brock when I was out there in KC, and he, he's he. It's amazing what he does with the group that he has. Yep. I mean, and how much of it he gets to keep. Like he, he's got a really good model. So um, he does. Excited you were with Brock. That, oh yeah, that's amazing. He he sent me a picture of a deal he was doing, uh, and when we were spending time together, I used to talk to him about the Brock price. I say, Brock, go get the Brock price. The Brock price is really low if he's buying it, and it is above market if he's selling it. And it's unbelievable he does what that it guy does. Yeah. yeah. If anybody builds yeah. a margin of safety in in his deals, that's the guy. It's uh, it's pretty incredible. He's a practitioner and one that. Uh, like I've been posting about, you know, uh, is prudent all of the time and puts himself in positions to win. And so uh, he's just a super smart guy, super humble, and just excited to be around, you know, gentlemen and, and women like that. So you sent me a post earlier this week and you, you were a little disappointed with how much traction it got. It was a meaningful post. And so, uh, you know, we've got a fair amount of listeners that come check out the Compression Podcast. Yep. Tell me a little bit about that post and, you know, the unpredictability of posting on LinkedIn is something that, you know, people who like us who post on a daily basis multiple times a day uh, can be a little frustrated with. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you know, uh, typically when I post something organically from my my own account, you know, we're, we're talking anywhere between two and 10,000 views um, on a regular basis. Um, usually pretty engaging content, something that I'm, I'm thinking about or going through, but you know, I've been posting, a f this has happened a couple of times. So I've, I've tested this a few times. I've been posting a few things around, um, you know, prudence and, and where the market is. And, 
uh, you know, where I, where I think that uh, things are kind of heading or where we're at. And, you know, it's unpopular right now. Nobody wants to hear it because, uh, you know, frankly, everybody's uh, doing projects right now. But if you just think back uh, to September, August, July of last year, you know, nobody was doing any projects. Maybe they started in August, but even pre July, I mean, it was no, I'm not buying anything. And here's why. And, you know, Sam Zell has a famous quote. And, you know, Buffett has one very similar, but it's when everybody is going right, you have to look left or when everybody is zigging, you have to zag. And many people will put that quote up, uh, but they act completely different. And so I'm just really, uh, you know, trying to, to, to prep people to say, look, the folks that you are talking about when you're saying you're going the opposite direction, you are the bandwagon right now, you know, and and it was very, it's, it's been an unpopular thing, but I've done it every single week for the past four weeks because I, I truly believe with what I'm seeing in our market and in the Midwest that prices are, are in, a, in a place that they're at the highest that I've seen since the last four and a half years or so. And the terms uh, that people are doing projects on are disincentivizing good business transactions. And, and so I, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to be a whistleblower right now to say, look, in you know, I frankly, when I meet with guys like Brock and some other guys that I know in the space, I had another great meeting with a, a big operator here uh, this week. You know, they're saying the same things. And so yeah. why, the exercise for me is to say, OK, I can't rely on on data because data only tells one little story. It's a snapshot. But when I start talking to operators that have been in the space for a long time and they're saying, hey, we're being really cautious right now still looking for projects, but being extremely cautious, man, it's, it's, um, it's got me a little bit interested in to see when this shift might happen. And it might happen a little faster than we think. Um, and it might happen while everybody is doing uh, these projects. It may be happening right now. I, it's just uh, very interesting. So um, with all the macroeconomic reading and research I've been doing for the past six months, I'm just trying to be very present in the moment and seeing where our business is. And um, I'm not sure many people want to hear that right now, especially people um, that are in my shoes. Yeah, they don't. Right. I mean, if you're in expansion phase and you're looking to grab what you can and you want yeah. to continue to go up after you do it. And you know, we pumped the brakes pretty hard because, you know, when I realized I didn't understand the market as well as I thought I did. Yeah. I got scared. Sure. Uh, there's just no way around it. Preservation of capital is the most important thing. And if I go into a deal with a too high cost basis, I can't preserve capital other than writing it out time wise. So, right. Yeah. I, I think what you're doing is absolutely prudent. And, you know, I, honestly, my prediction was we would have already been there, but we keep prolonging moratoriums. We keep yep. printing money and doing different types of stimulus. And, you know, the money that was created for landlord relief isn't actually getting to the landlords. Right. So, I mean, and I don't think it's magically going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to be really careful about pushing prices too high from this artificial lack of supply. I mean, maybe it's not artificial, but I think artificial lack of supply. Yes. And artificially uh, low interest rates. And so that is probably the biggest thing that's on uh, my mind. And when I was doing the Live Free Investors podcast, I got to bring on some incredible people that have done just an inordinate amount of transactions. And, you know, one thing that rings true in my mind is what Buffett said, you know, when the tide goes out, we're going to see who's swimming naked. And I think the tide's going to go out here in the next six to 12 months. But at the end of the day, man, we've got a lot going on in the uh, economy, in the financial system, and in the world, you know? I mean, we're still global pandemic. We're still politically divided. I mean, um, our president is is losing his base um, as we speak. I mean, we've got the Afghanistan thing pulling out of there. There's just a lot of turmoil. And when that happens, um, you know, and when the, the, the levers that the powers that be can pull no longer have impact, uh, that's when something shifts. And so, I mean, I think that uh, what I'm trying to do 
is uh, figure out what the right next move is and position myself to be able to um, to really run fast when it does. And so it's just a really hard position to be in as a small business owner, looking at adding the staff, adding the systems, adding the tech, adding the marketing, while you you aren't necessarily bringing the revenue in that you were previously because of the market, but it's the right thing to do. It's just hard to do because it's scary. And that's what, you know, Uncle Grant Cardone always talks about is, you know, when everybody else is, is uh, you know, pulling back, which is not happening yet, you have to put in. And, and so I'm just kind of waiting for that time and um, ready to put in the 10x action. But, you know, we're, we're um, you know, we're not saying it's not good to invest right now, right? I mean, like you think about the other options that you have in regards to investing capital. I mean, commercial real estate is still very attractive for a lot of people. And so it, it just comes back to your cost of capital, what your goals are, what you're trying to accomplish. But when you're exposed, like a uh, sponsor uh, myself is to financial markets and having to cover a lot of debt and all of these things, you really have to be thinking about your portfolio, make sure you can weather any storm uh, that's that's coming. So anyways, um, don't know where that's going to go, but just making sure that we're very, um, very aware. And that's the biggest piece, right? Is, is what we do on the compression podcast is being self-aware. You, you got to be professionally aware uh, as well and, and, and not just run with everybody else in what they're doing. So um, that's, that's the post that I've been putting out. We'll see if they, they grab some traction. What I love to do is to be able to 12 months from now, when something does shift, whatever time frame it is, I can point back to July, August, and September of this year and say, Hey guys, you know, not that I had a crystal ball, but I was at least talking about these things. For sure. And so this discussion about infrastructure, right? Positioning so that you're in, you're able to actually expand and grow instead of breaking the system or trying to do it in a reactive state, you're being proactive. Where does the courage come from in order to do that? Right. Because most people are, you know, they want to hold all their coins, right? They want to keep them there. And then whenever it happens, they, they want to deploy. Yep. Well, faith is a big one. Faith in, you know, a higher power, faith in yourself. So confidence. We've talked a lot about making promises to yourself and keeping them faith in your team and the people that you're around. But that's why you're seeing me spending so much time with other people that have been in this business longer uh, than me and just asking those tough questions because, you know, the data, like I said, the reports, the data, all fine and dandy, um, but it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, you'll, you'll find what you're looking for. Um, when you sit down with real operators and real people in the space, they're going to tell you how it is. And so uh, that's where I get my most important lessons from, you know, having calls with Ryan Smith, meeting with John Emanuels, meeting with Brock Thomas, meeting with all of these, uh, these guys and gals in the industry. And so the courage, I, I think, comes from uh, listening to them, hearing and seeing what they're doing, seeing their infrastructure that they've got and asking them hard questions like, hey, what would you do if you were me right now? And the prudence is the, is the piece keeps going back to prudence. I said, I'd be very cautiously optimistic uh, right now. Buy good deals, get your operations in line. I mean, that has been uh, the, the theme that I continue to hear is you have to structure your business and where you have the operations in place to allow you to weather those storms. And so, you know, that's the biggest piece that I'm doing right now is team building, you know, and, and making sure that everybody understands uh, what we're trying to accomplish and hiring the right people to get the capacity to handle what we've got. So, yeah, I think that uh, it comes from a lot of places. Uh, I, you know, right before we got on here, I was going through a morning affir affirmations uh, meditation, you know, the confidence doesn't just show up, you know, I work on it every single day, breathing, affirmations, writing, reading, talking to people. Um, so not one thing that that helps bring that courage, but um, a, a multitude of things. And I'm, I'll tell you this, man, I still feel that little bug in the back of my head saying, you know, man, you're not worthy. What are you doing? How, why do you think you can do this? You know, but I got to I got to silence that. I have to silence that because we've got seven or eight people now that are depending 
on us. And so I have a lot of responsibility. I have a responsibility to myself. I have a responsibility to my family. I have a responsibility to our employees. I have a responsibility to our investors. And so I take that in, in serious consideration and in regard. So all of those things push me uh, to be better and to be prepared and be confident on a regular basis. Outstanding. Outstanding. Yep. I remember when you went meditate. This is good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do a lot of the meditation now, man. All right. So we're going to pivot for the last half of the show. Okay. Right? And we're going to run through a little exercise that I think you'll get a kick out of. It's going to force you to do a little bit of deep thinking. And hopefully at the end, we'll, we'll have a little more clarity on where we're going. Because you'll hit me up from time to time. You say, Jerome, I got to level up, man. I, I, I got to level up. I need to go to the next level. I'm like, Logan. What game are you playing, man? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> and, and you know, then I have to go into crates and figure out what I can pull out to yep. help get us, a, you know, a little bit of edge, right? Because mm -hmm. at some point it becomes tweaking. The tweaking yeah. becomes the next level, not wholesale changes. And so right. this first question may be the toughest one for you to answer, but I know you got something in there. So when did you define yourself? most recently because i know there's been multiple points so when sure. was the most recent redefinition of who logan freeman is and what he's about yeah that's a great question and i think back actually right before um you know because we've we've got your conference coming up this weekend and you know speaking on a sunday i remember last year doing this and i i just looked back mentally to myself and said i am such a different person than i was last year i mean i mean not completely different but i'm very different in regards to to how i think and so this this year um redefining myself was um being able to make good decisions by myself right and and that was huge for me and it was having mental models to be able to think through complex you know scenarios challenges and be able to uh break those down and and create kind of the uh, the working up from those. And, uh, you know, I think that um, I thought about this, okay? When we started hiring people, it was no longer, you know, three guys just out there slinging multifamily real estate deals and just kind of throwing it together. It was, oh my gosh, we have got to get uh, some systems and some processes around these things so we can actually support that. And so I think the, the shift for me this year was def the defining moment that you asked about was when we started having delegation happen. Okay. So when I had to start delegating and set people said, Hey, well, I I'm not in your brain all the time. I need you to be able to communicate this so I can repeat this process going forward. And then that actually working. And, um, and so what I've had to do is think through all of the things that I, I was doing on a regular basis create some documents and some processes around them so they can go scale uh, without me being uh, needed. And that was a big defining moment because that's what business is about, is being able to do the right action repeatable at a scalable size. And, and so that was pretty big. And, and the last thing I'll say about the defining moment was, you know, we're as good as our people are and being able to build, you know, build them up in ways that are going to continue to grow them and stretch them is ultimately going to help our business. So I shifted from being a hundred percent producer to, you know, still 80% producer, but 20% coach. And I, I think that coach piece is going to continue to, to rise in the time that I spend because it's allowing me to get freedom back into my life, to work on our business and be uh, objective. Like we were talking about earlier on the show. Outstanding. And yeah, that, that was a big shift and yeah. you had a lot of anxiety around it when you mm -hmm. were going into it. And I think you're embracing it really well and people are, you know, growing and excited to be part of the team. And so this one's probably tougher than that one. Now that I think about it, cause I know, I know what you're going to say. And so I'll just come back with a, a, a good question after this one. So is the definition of yourself based on standards or beliefs that empower you? Or are they holding you back? Well, it's a, so I think I have two answers. I think it's definitely empowering me, um, but 
at the same time, it's ever changing. And, and what I mean by that, I guess, is, is that um, I have had to mold, shift, uh, kind of create, chip away all of my insecurities and all of my inefficiencies. And the insecurities I can work on, the inefficiencies, I either need to eliminate, automate, or delegate. And so the, uh, I think that the, the belief system that I have is now, hey, you have people around you that no problem is too big. You can solve those problems, but you cannot do it yourself. And so the belief that I am not alone in this <laughs> has been the biggest belief system that continues to help me shift and mold into what I want to become. And so I, I think that uh, the only thing holding me back is that little voice that I said uh, earlier, which is, you know, what makes you think you can do this? You know, what makes you think that you're good enough or you're smart enough? And, you know, m when I communicate right back to that voice, it's, you know, maybe I'm not right now, but that's what's pulling me up to become uh, the person that that voice goes away. And I've heard that voice a whole lot less this year than I ever did uh, last year. And that means that I'm building myself up and creating confidence within myself. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's how I would approach that for, for the time being, at least. Yeah, it does. I figured you were going to say, no, it empowers me. And so in order to get the holding back piece, I want you to go back right before you guys hired, I don't know, the first set of folks. Sure. And really the f folks designed to help you and you, how you've already talked about this a little bit. I'm, just, I'm trying to frame it so I get the question, the answer I want. Sure. So the Logan at that point versus the Logan today, what was the thing that you had, what was holding you back that you had to give up and you realized you had to give it up. So you made that change. Well, I mean, uh, for, for personally, for me, it was um, feeling worthy, you know, feeling worthy of this. And, you know, I had a lot of guilt and a lot of anxiety around, you know, all of the quote unquote success that we created for ourselves. And it happened so fast that it was hard to uh, break down. And, you know, I think that what I had to let go was of being the achievement based success guy. And I had to let that go in the sense that said, look, man, you know, you have a, a process that you're working on and you know where you're spending your time. If you are staying committed and intentional about that, you can't lie to yourself. You can only for a certain amount of time. But, you know, when I think about my time spent, because we've talked a lot about, you know, profit producing activities and most valuable priorities, sometimes you know, in the past, spending time with people like I just mentioned didn't feel like that. But now I know that's the most valuable thing that I've got is my relationships that I spend time with. And so being able to shift or or let go of the fact that, hey, I need to be on the phones, you know, five hours a day because that's what I used. That's what I was doing. I need to be creating content five hours a day and it needs to be you doing that. I need to be reading and writing five hours a day. You know, you know, that's what felt like productivity, but actually it was just being busy. And now the productivity is finding opportunities that are attached to people and knowing that those people bring opportunities into my life and, and not just trying to be so forceful with it. So making the shift from, um, you know, being so focused on uh, activity and being more magnetic uh, was a big belief that I had to just let go of. Uh, so that's kind of right before I think we started hiring all these people was, you know, my gosh, now I'm going to have to spend, <coughs> excuse me, all this time with these people. But at the end of the day, I heard that that quote from I think it was Marx or somebody else that said, you know, you're going to have to spend 150 percent more time up front, but it's going to give you 150 percent more back on the back end. And I took that to heart. I said, OK, I'm just going to I'm going to embrace that. I'm going to pour into these people. And my time is back into where it needs to be and what I need to focus on. So, but that was a hard transition. And I know that we went through that together on the, on the podcast, man. Yeah, that's outstanding. That's perfect, man. Great answer on that one. Here's the next one. What are you conditioned to believe that you can't do? Well, 
the uncertainty that I have is through, <laughs> and I've mentioned it a little bit, is, is how we continue to shift and pivot and evolve our business to, uh, to the changing market conditions. And I think the limiting belief that I have is, hey, I haven't, I haven't done this before, right? Uh, you haven't been here before. You know, um, the real operators in the space weathered the storms of, of 1990, of 2008, of coronavirus, and, and are still here. Very few of them, <laughs> but they're still here. And I haven't been there. So the uncertainty that I have is, okay, well, when you can't go buy, you know, a thousand units or you're not finding a thousand units, what is, what is, what is it that you're going to do to bring revenue into your, uh, into your business? And, you know, thankfully um, in the past, what I can lean on is even in the brokerage world and the 1031 exchange world, I've seen changes. I've, I've implemented different things and listened to the market very closely and made those pivots very quickly. But now being an owner of, you know, 1200 multifamily units and all of the, the capital that we've got and the team that we've got, it's a little bit, the ramifications of those decisions are a little bit larger. And so that's, what's creating more of a uh, uncertainty or a limiting belief in myself to say, well, you don't know what to do. So what are you going to do? And uh, that's where I have to have a little faith. That's where I have to have a little um, uh, in rely on my past to say, yeah, it's a bigger problem now and it has larger ramifications. But it, if you break it down, it's very similar to one that I went, um, you know, I went back, uh, you know, from the uh, from the brokerage world and when I was able to to actually pivot. But that's definitely the one thing, man, that's still controlling most of my um, in, un uncertainty or brings me more angst than anything else is, is that question of, well, how are you going to make the change and how are you going to continue to bring revenue in? Okay. 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 So hey, you've talked about this in the past. I don't know if we framed it specifically this way. So this will be interesting. What's your identity tied to? Well, First and foremost, my identity is tied to being a child of God, and and uh, I've had to embrace that over the last twelve to fifteen months as well, and that's been a good progression for myself. Um, and and thankfully, I've been doing that for the last seven and a half, eight years uh, at different levels for sure. But you know, if you look at my calendar and you look at at what I spend time on every single morning, it's it's reading the the Bible, it's meditating, it's praying, it's spending time at church, it's spending time at adoration, it's delivering food to the pantries, it's doing all of those things. So my identity, first and foremost, is to serve other people and try to get as many people as I can uh, to heaven, or at least help them uh, see that. So that's that's my first one. And I would say the, the second piece now, I mean, is, um, you know, being a father, being a father of two. And and my identity being tied to wanting to be a very good example for those children. And a third, you know, I guess uh, maybe not third. This should this is actually second. The being father as a third is is being a, a husband to Taylor uh, as well. Uh, and then from the professional side, man, I mean, the identity comes from, you know, entrepreneur, you know, and, and I mean, the real version of an entrepreneur. It's the Stephen Schwartzman's of, of Blackstone who turned 400,000 into over 450 billion, uh, you know, from, from his company. And so it's the uh, willingness to accept the challenge of trying to grow a business, trying to create jobs, trying to create housing. It's not easy. That's why not everybody does it. Um, but being able to, to challenge that and, and have that fuel the fire every single day is where my identity comes from. I'm trying to do something that's difficult. And I love that. And I, and I, I appreciate that challenge uh, every single day. So, you know, being the best version of myself is obviously, um, you know, a big piece of my identity as well. Solid there. Um, and so those are the most important hats you wear. That's right. Um, it's interesting because you lump in your philanthropy into the child of God, it's your service work. That's, yes, right. That's really interesting. I'll, I'll come back to that at some other point. It won't be today, but sure. I'll come back up. Yeah. I mean, I think um, that to, to whom much is given, much is expected, you know, and, and I feel like God has blessed me in ways that not everybody is blessed. Sure. Had challenges in life, but 
Uh, I've always had the resources to be able to get through those challenges as well. And I recognize that not everybody does. And so I want to use that to my best uh, ability and, and maybe even try to pull some people out, you know, of a vicious cycle. And, and that's, uh, that's very re- rewarding, but it's also something that I feel like I'm called to do. You know, when I started my blog 10 and a half years ago, you know, the, the tagline was rising above mediocrity and, let, and, and showing you how to live your life to the highest potential. You know, we've all heard that kind of stuff, but and I didn't know where that blog was going to go. It's still on WordPress today. If you go back and look at it, that was the early, early Logan. You know, I was posting every single week writing about things that I was learning. But I mean, I now know that that the reason I was doing that was because um, I feel like I have a message or a way that I can live my life that will will bring people up. And I, and I genuinely want to do that. And I love to watch people see their potential actually fulfilled. And the most sad thing is when somebody just accepts where they're at and says, well, um, this is where I'm going to stay. It's just very, and I try, used to be forceful to say, no, that's not, you do, you have a decision. Now it's just, I feel for those people. And if I can do something, if I can show them, write something, do something like this podcast that helps lift them up, then, you know, that's a, that's a part of my, my life's work right there, Jerome. Yeah. To be an inspiration to others because you have access to it. And, you know, they do too. They just may not be exposed or had something to happen that forced them to go seeking. Exactly. So, you, you said you've been focused on faith at varying levels over the past seven years. What was magical about seven years ago? Well, seven years ago was, you know, when I was cut from the NFL and, and uh, shortly thereafter, you know, lost my father and uh, lost my father to his addiction with drugs and alcohol and complications from that. And so, you know, frankly, I got to see firsthand what your decisions, you know, the act, the outcomes of your decisions. And, you know, in some ways, my, my father gave me the best gift that he could have ever given me. And it was to show me that priorities in your priorities in life will di- outcome dictate the outcome of, of your life and the choices that you make. And so, um, you know, I, I, I made a mark to myself when that happened. I remember uh, giving my dad's eulogy, stepping off, seeing all my friends in the, in the crowd crying their eyes out. And, and, and it was when I stepped off that pulpit and said, that's not going to be me. Nobody's going to be at my funeral doing this right now when I'm 56 years old. You know, I'm going to be the guy that's pulling people up until I'm hopefully 100 years old, you know, and, and that's the that was the defining moment for me was, you know, and, and Tony Robbins says, you know, your, uh, your shoulds have to become musts. And that became a, a must for me was I will not live a life that will lead uh, to this outcome. And uh, I made peace with my, my father, you know, uh, and I, and I, and I recognize the lessons that he's learned or he, I learned from him, but that was the biggest defining moment was when somebody very close to me, uh, that had big impact on my life, you know, never got to meet this one and my other one and my wife and walk any of his daughters down the aisle or see me build a business or any of those things, you know, and, and Bella will never say, you know, where's, 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 uh, where's Papa Freeman, you know, she just never will. Um, maybe she'll ask it someday, but I'll have to have a response for that. And that, that's powerful. That's visceral. My, uh, hair on my arm is sticking up. I'm getting a little bit teary eyed just thinking about that. Right. So those visceral things that I hold very close to me are uh, that what do, what my identity really is tied to. And I see kind of where you're you're pulling this back out to. But to go back to that painful point in my life is is uh, is a non negotiable that will just never happen. And uh, thankfully, I've been able to see that firsthand um, the outcomes of that and the impact that it's had on me and my family. So I think that's probably the, the biggest driver of Logan Freeman's identity right there. There we go. Not the roles, but the actual <laughs> inspiration. That's right. And that inspiration won't ever go away. I, I didn't know my grandfather's, so I, I know what that feels like. Yeah. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have a great dad and I think you're doing an amazing job with Bella and Z man. And, you know, the thing with that is they're 
when when they have kids, they'll assuming that that's that's what they want to do. They'll have the opportunity to have a Papa Freeman, and that's right. Be young and fit and healthy and ready to do the things that you know you wish your dad would have been able to do with your kids. And that's exactly right. Know, I, I go above and beyond, to, at least I try to, to make sure that my kids get the experience that I missed. Yep. Right, because that I believe is a game changer. There's just a a different level of wisdom that comes from that. So um, great answer, man. We, we got it out. And, yep. um, and the last thing I'll say that, about that, Jerome, is <clears throat> is uh, family is so important. And yep. you can have the best friends, the best business partners in the world. But when it comes down to it, your family typically is going to be with you until they're here, you know, and until they're gone. Sorry. And so it's so important to uh, have a strong family structure and have different people pouring into your kids because us as parents, we're only, you, you know, we're, we can only do so much, you know, their friends, the family that they spend time with is uh, so important. Some of the best families I've seen have uh, such a close knit. And I've always was like thinking about it, like, man, it seems like they're obsessed with each other. And now I realize it's actually a really good thing <laughs> if it's a healthy, you know, situation that you're in. Um, and, and I want to build that. I want to build that for, for my family and, and for generations, you know, first generation Freeman here in Kansas city, you know, um, I want to have stuff in my name that people look to and say, man, that's a good family. You know, like that is a good family. They did a lot of good things. And, uh, that's the legacy piece, right? <clears throat> that's, that's really, so now we're getting to the good stuff, right? So you know, people used to talk about it that way, right? The kid shows up, your last name is this. Oh, you come from a good family, you know, stamp of approval immediately versus now everybody just kind of went off. We don't know who we're getting or what we're getting. Yep. <clears throat> Level of standards or so. All right. I'm going to shift on you now. Here we go. Okay. Are you telling yourself things so that your current situation makes sense, even if you don't like it? I think we all do. Right. I think we all do. Um, yes. I think the answer is yes. I, I think that for me, you know, I rationalize uh, a lot of my health choices in regards to, you know, what I eat and drink as, as this is um, enjoyment. This is pleasurable. This is, you know, building experiences. Uh, and I rationalize that. That's the hardest thing for me to to overcome um, is, is, uh, you know, focused on delaying gratification and not the Epicurean mindset, which is, you know, pleasure now. And, you, you know, I, it's a double-edged sword because I'm built, I'm building a life. Like I sat down with Brock yesterday and my biggest question to him was, you know, are you enjoying this? You know, like, are you enjoying this? And I could see in his eyes that uh, he's mastered his craft and that guy needs a challenge and he will never be satisfied because unless he's challenged and growing, he has that growth mindset. That's just all there is to it. And it was a big light bulb for me. Same thing is I have to be challenged. I have to be, I have to be growing. So, you, you know, September this year, I have focused on uh, a few different things. It's not necessarily challenging myself in the sense of, you know, working as hard as I possibly can, but it's how can I build a sustainable uh, life that attracts things to me instead of me having to put it out there. And that's a hard shift for me because it's not what I'm used to doing. So what I've told myself was in the past, hey, you can't enjoy what you do on a regular basis. Well, I kind of went on the other spectrum that says you should enjoy every single day. And now I'm finding kind of a happy medium, right? So it was, you can't enjoy it. Now, it, and then it was, you got to enjoy every day uh, to the fullest. And now it's okay. Yes, you need to enjoy it, but in in uh, moderation. And thankfully, you know, Taylor last night after we came back from date night, she said, man, I'm just so proud of you. And I said, well, what? why? And she's like, the changes you have made with your drinking and your eating is just I, it, nobody can do that. I don't know how you do that. Like you just made a decision and you just did it. Well, I said I, I started to identify with a guy who doesn't uh, go uh, to the other spectrum. Right. And I, I got to test both sides, you know, so I'm on one side of being disciplined and intentional as much as possible. And then the other side of, 
you know, hey, just no routines, just kind of do whatever you want. Um, but then you find that that happy medium where you can bring both in and and create a really awesome lifestyle. And uh, hearing that from my wife, who knows me better than anybody, um, was impactful because you know she's she's like you know I just <laughs> and she tracks my weight loss journey and and all this stuff with me, and she's like I just want you to see the results. I'm like, baby, I can I can see it. This this shirt is hanging off of me. I got three three loops on the belt. Now I've got, you know, my pants are fitted. It's, so it's, it's happening. It's, it's happening. But um, to hear that from people very close to you was, was really important, but back to your question of what's holding me back or what am I accepting? It, it's, it's mostly around um, if I get my mind to say, Hey, I'm going to enjoy, or I'm going to stay focused. Then I just go all in on one of those and creating this nice uh, counterbalance between the two is is uh, what the journey I'm on to try to get to. And I know that's a little vague, but it's uh, it's what's in my mind and, and in my heart and, and what's I'm you know, what I'm working on, on a regular basis. So being able to put both of those in action on a regular regular basis is is uh, the the goal, I guess you could say. All right. I got a bunch more here, but I'm going to give you this one last one to put a bow on this thing. Okay. If you met your higher power on your deathbed today and they went down the checklist of all the things you were supposed to do, all the impact you were supposed to have, how comfortable would you be with that conversation? I'd be very uncomfortable. I, I would be very uncomfortable. And the reason being is I know my vices. I know... I know my sins. I know my my wrongdoings. And uh, Peter said it in the Bible. I I know not what I do. What I not what I should do, but I what I want to do. And <laughs> and I think that that's the biggest thing for me is uh, there's still things in in my life that I'm working on ridding and working on uh, you know uh, taking care of that I know are my challenges. And I just kind of let them sit there and fester a little bit more than um, actually embracing them and, and changing them. And so, you know, no matter where you go, there you are. And I'm, I'm really happy with myself most of the time, but I, I get on a, a decision train sometimes that allows me to kind of slump down and say, hopefully nobody's watching. And I'm just going to sit here for <laughs> you know 45 minutes and, 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 uh, feel sorry for myself or something like that. And so I, I would be very uncomfortable um, only because I know what my potential is. I know my potential and I don't always live up to that potential. And I think the hardest thing for, for what God would say to me is, is son, you, you sat there for six years and did the same thing. What, what, what could you have done with that, that time? If you, if you allocated it in the right way, you know, and, and my other thing is, is to, I, I never feel like I'm, I'm giving back enough. Um, if you looked at my life, most people would be like, you, 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 it's, it's in, it's in your daily process most of the time, but I always have a feeling of, of guilt around, um, you know, not giving back when I see, uh, things like, uh, hap that happen around the, around the world. So I, I do think there's a part of me that is, uh, you know, not, uh, fulfilling my potential in regards to to giving back and so that's always in my mind as well nice 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 what are you gonna do you're gonna do something about it or you i am gonna, gonna do around? something about it i i am doing things about it um and, and it's that fine balance that we just talked about about okay uh yes i'm called to serve others but i'm also called to serve my wife my children and my employees and so you have to uh, find that that fine balance. And so I've, I've played family. I've played philanthropists uh, on both sides of the, of the ball the last seven years. And what I'm creating is that nice middle ground to say, how do I do this on an ongoing basis that's sustainable and, and focus my resources, energy and time in the right places in regards to both of those. And so I'm being I'm, I'm becoming OK um, and more comfortable with that uh, approach than staying, OK, well, you know, I need to have four times where I'm volunteering scheduled on the calendar every single month. Instead of doing that, it's, hey, when these things are coming into my life, saying yes, being open to them and saying, um, yeah, let's do that instead of, uh, no, I don't have time for that. So I think that 
you know, for me, it's, it's a, it's a balance act on, on that, but I always have to go back to what my main calling is in, in my family and my faith, which, you know, if that's not in the right spot, then you can't serve others anyways. You know, I mean, you just can't, you have to make sure that your heart, your family's heart um, it, are in good places that will exponentially allow you to do more. And uh, I'm reading books that, that, uh, you know, support that thesis. And I've seen be very successful. Like, uh, for example, and I know I talk about this guy a lot, but Steven Schwartzman, um, you, you know, uh, he's worth 10 billion now. Um, it, you know, and that's a, that's an incredible, incredible accomplishment, but hearing his, uh, philanthropic, you know, uh, ventures with starting the, the Schwartzman's scholars for giving $40 million to the uh, New York City Catholic Diocese to pay for school for the underprivileged kids. Uh, 80% of Catholic students are underprivileged. 80%. And it is the, the largest institution of housing um, in the country. So just think about that. 80% come from underprivileged uh, communities and households. And it's because of guys like Stephen Schwartzman that give $40 million to that resource. Guys like Ray Dalio, who bought a um, hundred million dollars worth of textbooks and iPads for, um, I think it, I think he's in Massachusetts, his, his community in Massachusetts. And so th that's what inspires me. Um, I don't know if I'll ever be at that, you know, that level, but it doesn't matter. That's not the, they made a choice to do that and to say yes to that. So I'm kind of rambling on a little bit, but that's what fires me up when I think about that. Love it. Love it, man. This, this was a good one. At least gave me more clarity and insight into what you're thinking and how you're thinking and also allowing you to see your progress, but also getting that confirmation. Absolutely. The person who you want, the single person who you want the most approval for. That's right. From that things are working and that the adjustments that you're making are leading you to a better life when we're, you're able to take care of your family in a way that maybe you wouldn't and if you were still 300 some pounds that's and right so on and so forth so man it's just been an amazing journey we're we're coming up on the fourth quarter yep you know it, it's we're closing in on the target and you know I, i'm just grateful to be a part of this journey with you brother yeah it's gonna be a fun fun three months to finish up the the year so i'm excited to uh, to hit this goal and to uh, put a button on it and, and figure out what's next, which is really exciting. So we'll leave you with a quote. And this is from a humorist and uh, a talk show host. And, and it's about flexibility and change. OK, because we've talked a lot about that on the podcast today. He says this real life is about reacting quickly to the opportunity at hand, not the opportunity you envisioned. Not thinking and scheming for the future, but letting it happen. I think there is so much truth from Conan O'Brien with that quote right there. And so that's what we want to get out of this episode today is identity and reacting to the opportunity at hand. Jerome, thank you for leading today's session. That was very helpful for me. And I know it's going to be helpful for all the listeners and I want to always say thank you for tuning in. Uh, the messages that I get on a regular basis is uh, is just inspiring. You know, um, yeah, I heard somebody the other day that I had no idea listened to the podcast, somebody that I revere in my life and says, well, you know, it's what a compressor does. And I was like, wait, you listen to the podcast? It's like, yeah, dude, like every single week. I'm like, what? Uh, that was just awesome, man. It was just impact, right? He's like, well, you know, you got to be confident. You got to be omnipresent. You got to focus on magnitude and multitude. You got to be positive, patient, and present. And I'm like, wait, that's catching on. <laughs> that's great. That is fantastic. So anyways, I appreciate all of you guys tuning in for another episode of the Compression Podcast. Jerome, thanks for being here, especially with your crazy busy schedule uh, this week. Uh, this will air after your amazing conference, but uh, super excited about that. And, and it's going to be a great time. So thanks again. Thank you. Hey, compressors, if something you heard struck you, made you feel a little bit uncomfortable, good. Head on over to compressionpodcast.com. And then you can also subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast at. If you feel inclined to, please leave us a review. It's obviously helpful. But 
Instead, I'm gonna call you out today. I'm gonna call you out and make sure that you do your part sharing this message by sharing it with one person that might need to hear what we talked about today. Be great, nothing else pays.